Imagine Boston in the 1860s. It is a growing hub of the Northeast, a destination for immigrants and high-minded artists alike. The city is centered on a thriving downtown business district. Over two days in November 1872, everything changed. The Great Boston Fire of 1872 is one of the cataclysmic events in Boston's history, one of the reasons why in 1873 there's a major depression, a financial panic. But consequently, as a result of this, the business district rebuilds and also expands. And you see other businesses moving to areas outside of what had been the financial district and the stretch along the south corridor, south border of Boston Common. The filling of the Back Bay is completed in 1882, and with it, a new area for Boston's wealthy elite to live. As they flocked to the new neighborhood, the areas along Boston Common needed new tenants, and an arts district was born. To understand Piano Row, you have to understand the rise of Washington Street. Washington Street was a theater district from the early to mid 19th century. Boston spent the first hundred years with theater being banned by the Puritans. They thought it would be really wrong to have someone pretending to be someone else, other people paying to be entertained in this way. So theater only is legalized in Boston in 1793. So it made sense as the arts and music began to take hold that those businesses were going to grow up along Washington Street as well. If you wanted to have any kind of entertainment at home, you would have to make your own music. And so a piano is one way to do it. It's one way of middle class aspirations would be to have a piano. Remember, there are no radios, no television, and it would make sense for different piano manufacturers to have their showrooms right along here. I started when I was 16 in the piano store and uh, working for my dad, my uncle. My grandfather used to sell pianos in what would be like a trunk show. If you're going to look at something as big as a piano, well, you should give people an opportunity to hear how they sound. And so it led to this, this rise and development of the concept of a music hall. And that is what really began to shape Piano Row, were these showrooms. There was a Baldwin store. There was an organ store. There were two musical instrument stores, Boston Music Company, and the other is Carl Fisher Company out of Chicago. It's hard to believe that there were so many buildings that sold pianos in the past, but that was a very uh, major commercial industry here in Boston. As we see with other neighborhoods, as the economy changes, businesses come and go, and that impacts how buildings are used. This was a period of great change. Um, tall buildings, 125 feet and, and slightly above, uh, were not the norm in Boston at that time. And this was a, an, an area through commerce, through piano uh, manufacture and music was changing rapidly. The heart of the burgeoning piano row and theater district was the Majestic Theater, a 1,200-seat jewel of design. The Majestic Theater really anchored piano row. It declared itself to be a great and significant theater venue. Inside the theater, you see the cantilevered balconies. This was the first theater where lighting was actually integrated as an architectural element and not simply treated as an add-on after the original design. In addition to a piano showroom, the Steinert family also built Steinert Hall, a performance space with a unique geography. It had curves, it used domes, it used everything you think of and associate with late 18th century architecture, including the use of multiple colors. Remember, in the late 19th century, Boston's roads were a cacophony of streetcars, pedestrians, and horses. This did not lend itself to a positive listening environment at street level. Therefore, the hall was built 40 feet underground to create an acoustically perfect space. Everybody who was anybody in Boston came to the opening. It was pretty nice. Paderewski played there, the great pianist who later became the uh, prime minister of Poland. In between the Majestic Theater and Steinert Hall stood the Colonial Theater which gained a reputation as a testing ground for musicals before they headed to Broadway. Richard Rodgers showed up with Oscar Hammerstein in a production called Green Grow the Lilacs. It was very well received here, but the recommendation was made that they come up with a different name that was a little punchier and decided to take the name from the closing song, Oklahoma. Piano Row happened because of this kind of cultural and intellectual 
cauldron that was Boston. Hidden within that intellectual cauldron were many secret clubs and societies, including the Masons, which housed their Grand Lodge in a corner of Piano Row. Benjamin Franklin was one of the proponents of the Masonic Lodge in America, Paul Revere, Joseph Warren. The current Masonic Lodge was built as an Italian Renaissance revival building by the firm of Loring and Phipps. You'll start seeing in this period the buildings in this area adopting Italian Renaissance revival as an architectural style. It represented a kind of a dignity, and authority, a sense of arrival. The building at Three Boylston Place, um, it's also known as the Ancient Landmark Building. So that was constructed in 1888, and it's actually a really interesting um, building. It originally was built um, as a lodge for the Independent Order of Odd Fellows. Boston was a city with a lot of secret clubs. You could only be a member if you were elected. This was a private fraternity that was started in the UK in the 18th century. A very difficult period in history, um, lots of low mortality. Uh, uh, famine, sickness, uh, and this was a group of people who had banded together from all walks in life um, to create a pool of money that they would all invest into and that would be apportioned off to people who had fallen on hard times to deal with bereavement issues, sickness or illness. This was deemed um, by the general populace at the time as a very odd thing to do and hence the name, they were the Odd Fellows. As Boston continued to grow through the 1920s and 30s, there were technological changes that would affect the culture and their entertainment options. 1927 was the beginning of concert broadcast by CBS. At that point, everybody wanted a radio so they could hear a concert broadcast for free, live from Radio City Music Hall. In one year, 90% of the player pieces went away. Every piano dealer became a radio dealer. You don't need the trouble of learning how to play the piano or how to buy a piano. First you lose the uh, player business, then two years later or the next year after that you begin the Great Depression after the big crash of 29. You start seeing a shift going to vaudeville in venues that previously had been considered kind of serious or respectable theater. Then when you started seeing live theater go into decline universally, what happens to those old venues? How do they get repurposed? You see the decline of the Majestic Theater, for example, that was bought and turned into a movie house. Movies and radio really put vaudeville and theater almost out of business because they're cheaper to run. You also could have a movie theater in Randolph or in Stoughton. You don't have to come downtown to be entertained. At the end of 1942, another tragic fire had a dramatic impact on the city of Boston. The end of November 1942 was when the horrible Coconut Grove fire happened, and that was right around the corner. Almost 500 people lost their lives in a fire that lasted just over 15 minutes. They looked at the subterranean concert hall. They looked at the lack of egress and pretty quickly shut it down. My father, my grandfather, my uncle had made the decision that they're just not going to use the hall anymore. They, they felt it was too much of a risk to have people that far from an exit. Steinert Hall still stands today in its underground opulence, waiting for the right time to be brought up to fire code and reopened to the public. As the area continues to decline, it is given an inauspicious nickname. The first time combat zone was used was 1965. When I was a kid, certainly the theater district was not an area that, you know, my parents would typically take me to as the combat zone. I remember, you know, lock the doors, roll up the windows, and don't look. So in 1973, they enacted a zoning bylaw to concentrate that sort of adult entertainment. It was kind of the wild days of the early 70s when things were going on. It was really crazy. I can't imagine Mayor Collins sitting around saying, where should we put the adult entertainment? But question is, where shouldn't we put the adult entertainment? You have the area then being condoned as a place where, you know, you can expect bad things to happen. In Boston and other major American cities, urban decay began to take hold. A movement known as urban renewal was seen as a solution to these areas. I think people forget that Boston was a dying city. Population was fleeing like crazy, and the city was desperate to try to figure out a way to change it. At that time, urban renewal was considered the solution. It was a federal program. 
and its objective was to improve what was called blighted areas, areas that were deemed unsafe, full of crime. We have the Prudential Center go up, and then the Hancock goes up. And in the meantime, we're still sitting over here with our old building looking uh, kind of frumpy. They did some things to modernize the building to make it look better. And part of this was at the insistence of the Magnavox company. So we covered up all the beautiful mahogany in the lobby and painted it gray. And it's a travesty that they did that, but that was to make it look cool. Slowly, I think people began to see that these big urban renewal projects had social impacts that were not particularly positive. They destroyed the character of many places. The successes and failures of urban renewal are still debated to this day. Within Piano Row, there was one long gestating urban renewal project, the Massachusetts Transportation Building. 1980 was when they started tearing down buildings to build the Transportation Building. And that was a real godsend for this part of the city. I mean, that brought in people, it brought in jobs. And the goal was to kind of put an official government presence in an area so close to the combat zone. They designed it to accommodate passers-by. They also were the first Massachusetts government building to have an on-site daycare facility. They wanted to create this sense of serving not just the whole community, but the whole employee. After the transportation building was opened for use by the public, a small college focused on the arts and communication was looking to expand. Emerson had had a lot of different homes over the course of its life. It was out on Huntington Avenue for a while, and then by the 1960s, 70s, it's in the Back Bay as the city is declining, looking for possibly building a campus somewhere else. The president set his sights on Lawrence as a place he could have a campus along the Merrimack River. In 1989, the Boston real estate market went into a very deep recession. There were properties that were either entirely vacant or half vacant in and around the Majestic Theater. One of them was what's now called the Anson Building, 180 Tremont Street, and so we were able to buy it. The little building at the time uh, was in foreclosure, and so the lender offered it for sale at a very low price. Emerson's purchase of the little building led to a renewed interest in this distinctive office building. The little building stands on the site of the Hotel Pelham, which was the first building to house French flats in Boston first kind of apartment hotel. William Muir Whitehill, the great Boston um, architectural historian, called it perhaps the greatest office building in Boston of its period. My dentist was in the little building. When I was old enough to take the green line, I'd get off at the Boylston Street stop. There was an underground passageway. Then I'd go up to my dentist. When they bought the little building, we thought, oh my god, there goes all the walk-in traffic. This is going to kill the neighborhood. And then we figured out that having kids' eyes and ears on the street is just gonna make it really hard for purse snatchers and muggers and people like that to bother ordinary people at the Boylston Tea Stop. I mean, all these fresh faces you see around, it's been great. Emerson coming into this neighborhood was a huge infusion of energy and life and new uses and new lives for these buildings. So we kept buying property, ultimately sold all of the Back Bay property and moved the entire college to the theater district. It was really Ted Cutler, Jackie Liebergott, and Rob Silverman, the three of them, planned the move from the Back Bay to where we are now. They saw that they could be pioneers, and, and they were, in fact, pioneers. The Paramount Center is a somewhat different story. That was one where Mayor Menino became actively involved, and he actually asked Emerson if we would go in there, acquire that theater, and bring it back to life. Those theaters were in terrible condition. They were occupied by bats and rats and all sorts of vermin and not people. We ended up saving three walls. Everything else had to be replaced or built new, but we did keep the essence of the old theater there. This is another miracle performed by Emerson College. Remember a few years ago when we had some ideas of moving to some God-forsaken city outside of Boston. Tom Menino understood the importance of the colleges in Boston. You know, it was the piano industry fold. Well, what's going to replace it? Could we find another industry like that that was going to take over these buildings? You know, there could be automobile showrooms or something else. Probably not an effective use of the space. College 
is. Paramount Center represents a giant step, a step forward in the city's long-standing effort to revitalize the theater district in the lower Washington Street. Beyond renovating the historic edifices along Piano Row, Emerson soon began to build new buildings, but continued to maintain the character of the district. The Piano Row dorm, that was a completely new project. We worked with Emerson in terms of the height and the scale and the architecture to make sure it fit in. I think one of the interesting things about Boston is that interesting blend of old and new. I think uh, the projects here at Piano Row and some of the work that's been done by Emerson really exemplify that because you have new lives for these buildings, uh, but they continue to retain their character and you're on the streetscape, you still feel like you're in an old city. Boylston Place has done a great job inserting a new piece of construction adjacent to some important historic buildings in this really funky little alley that really reflects a 19th century past. What was unique about the site at 1 to 3 Boylston Place, the physical size of the footprint um, was incredibly small. As we had to construct the entire 90,000 square foot building um, through a 14 foot wide opening. And we really wanted the building to blend in, uh, to harmonize with the rest of the block. There was terracotta and there was brick and there was copper and there was metal. So we used the same materials on our new building at Boylston Place, but we just executed them in a very contemporary way. I think we all understand that Emerson animates uh, Boston just as uh, Boston animates uh, us. The theater district is their home. It's been their home for over 20 years. They've contributed so much to revitalization of this district and as to its continued success. Last time I was in this alley, it was probably 20 plus years ago, and it certainly has changed. Well, the history of the theater district's ever written, Emerson College should be the first five chapters. The rise, fall, and return of Piano Row is a microcosm of Boston as a whole. Boston is a remarkable place for its cycles of history. And when I walk through Piano Row today, what I see is this turn in the cycles of history. We often talk about um, alleys and streets having a, a rhythm and a beat. And the previous structure, at number one and two, Boston Place, did not follow that beat. And we restore the beat in a very contemporary way so that we're speaking about buildings of our time but we're maintaining that, that rhythm to the street. Although the Piano Row Historic District has changed dramatically, signs of its musical history abound. I just can't imagine Boston without a Steinway store on Boylston Street. It's been there since 1896. It's, it ought to continue for another 100 years. It'd be a great place to be.